So. Hey, William. ¿Qué pasa? You have Tanakh spelled better. Yeah. Uh, the, T-A-N-A-C-H. The website is actually correct also now. Faith, Faith Schwalbe. Oh, yeah. Was Jesus a real rabbi? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Well, the answer is could not have been. Okay, let's talk about the word rabbi for a minute and, and re- realize what it means. Okay, the word rabbi does not mean teacher. The word rabbi has never meant teacher. I'd like to personally shoot the person who ever said that the word rabbi meant teacher. Oh, wait, I think that's actually the New Testament and incorrect. Uh, first of all, the word rabbi comes from the word rab, which means great. You know, Jews who uh, go to services and know the, the, know, know the, uh, the, the uh, prayer book uh, will sing, Shalom Rab, Shalom Rab, Al Yisrael Amcha. Okay, Shalom Rab does not mean hello, Rabbi. Shalom, Rab. No, it means a great peace. Shalom is peace. Rab is an adjective describing peace as great. So the word Rabbi means my great person, my great one. Now, uh, in the post-Second Temple destruction period, so beginning at the year 70 CE, concept of rabbi as a title gained popularity, became, became popular. And so after the year 70 is when you have the title of rabbi come into existence. Before that, a person may have been referred to as a rabbi later, but the, but the, but the term rabbi wasn't used regarding them until after 70. So Jesus would never have been called rabbi in his lifetime. Oh, but wait a minute, rabbi. Don't you know, you stupid fool, that there is uh, places in Matthew and in John where Jesus is called rabbi? Yeah, but that's how Christian scholars learn how to date the text of the book of Matthew, or at least that one section, and sections of the Gospel of John, because if it uses the term rabbi to refer to a title, then it could not have been written until after the assembly because it didn't exist. It would be like it, it would be like saying, you wouldn't have to know the cell phone number of Abraham Lincoln, would you? <laughs> right. Okay, because cell phones didn't exist. And if you had a reference to, uh, what's this called? It, um, if you had a reference to uh, Jesus being a rabbi, that text had to have been written post-New uh, Testament. I'm sorry, post-year 70. Remember, the first gospel was Mark, and Christian scholars will say that the gospel of Mark was written around the middle 60s, okay, about the time of the, of the Jewish rebellion against Rome, which was 66. So that's... 30 plus years after the death and burial of Jesus, after Jesus was dead and buried. So, and, and again, I'm going to say it's Christian scholars who, among many things, use the use of the term rabbi to date the Gospel of John as late as they do. Okay, Matthew came second after Mark to be written. And in Mark, I think in only two verses, okay, is Jesus ever called rabbi? And those verses have to have been have to have been used post seventy. Luke, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Luke, Mark, and Luke don't use the term uh, rabbi. It's only Matthew and John, if I remember correctly. John is dated by most Christian scholars at about the year ninety or later. Okay, and there are, there are other reasons we're not going to get into. I'm just, I'm an old man. I'm not even sure right now I could remember them, but. Uh, the use of the term rabbi, uh, it, look, if you go to a Jewish high school, okay, and you see a teacher there, they're not a rabbi. If the word rabbi meant teacher, then every single teacher should be legitimately called rabbi. I'll give you another, another example. I revere you. If I revere you, does that mean you are a reverend? Because the word reverend means someone who is revered? No. To be a reverend, you have to go to a specific school okay, a seminary, and be ordained as a reverend by that denomination or by that local church or however the system works, depending on the denomination of Christianity. To throw but a just, clarifier in there, so every every rabbi is a teacher, but not every teacher is a rabbi. 
That's and the, the word that's rabbi the, doesn't mean teacher. Right, and they're, and right. just because a rabbi teaches, that's not what makes him a rabbi. What yeah. makes him a rabbi is that he has been ordained by an ordaining body recognized by the Jewish people to ordain someone as a rabbi. Okay. Otherwise, every single person who teaches could be legitimately called rabbi if the word rabbi really meant teacher, which it doesn't. So, no, Jesus would not have been a rabbi he, in his lifetime, he would never have heard himself referred to as a rabbi. Oh, no, Jesus was not a rabbi and would never have been called a rabbi because he was dead and buried 30 plus years before the the, uh, uh, the destruction of the simple second temple. Now, on another note, this was a later transformation, if you want to call it that. But rabbi currently, not originally, currently also stands for Rosh B'nai Israel, which is the leaders of the children of Israel. So they kind of use that as a play on words uh, and kind of like. The Israel okay. is acronym for the Patriarchs and Matriarchs. So. Right. Anyway. Um, okay. All right. Go ahead, Vincent, with your question. How are you tonight, first of all? I'm, I'm doing wonderful. A and, question uh, about Jesus. Now, if we remove the Pauline um, letters and the writings, everything about Pauline, and you remove Mark and Luke, because that, that seems like they, they inserted that birth narrative in there. Um, Ma Matthew and Luke. Uh huh. Matthew and Luke. Um, what? I'm sorry. Matthew and Luke. Sorry. Yes. So, obviously, this man. Now, uh, I'm I'm just coming in from a different angle. I'm not. I'm not a uh, uh, Jesus supporter, but I'm just trying to come in from a different angle. Sure. Um. This this man came with some teachings. He obviously had some information that was oral or maybe the book of Enoch's, he got some information where he was teaching and later on he was uh, presented as a god or, or something. I don't know. But uh, what's your take on that? I kind of I kind of agree. I, I think that his presence here was not for the intention of being a god. I think that the, the people just took it and developed their own little deity out of him that's my personal opinion i don't think he would have i mean there's definitely there's areas of the new testament where he says he told the peter he says who do you say that i am and uh but but i think he asked him the question because he wasn't sure what anybody thought of him he didn't know if they thought he was a prophet yeah, or whatever right. and so um and he said blessed are you whatever but the thing about it is no one there's nothing in the script or in the, you could call it a script actually there's nothing in the text that suggests that jesus told anybody quote unquote write this down you know this is for me I'm saying right. this everything else was written about him you know 30 40 and 50 years later so I just think this is something that's not trustworthy anyway so See, Rabbi that, right. that, 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 that is my point that I would like to make is we don't know what Jesus said or what Jesus did or what happened with Jesus to Jesus for Jesus because the writers of the Christian's New Testament were Christians. They were believers in Jesus as the Jesus, as the Christ. And so mm. if you take a look at the four Gospels, they are so filled with internal contradictions, one to the other, that which one do you trust? How do you know what to trust? How do you know what to believe if, 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 uh, if they disagree on so much? And yet, and if they're supposed to be um, what's the Christian terminology, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, right. how can they be in such disagreement with each other unless, of course, there are four different Holy Spirits? Vincent, go ahead and hang up now. You can just tune in for the rest of your answer, Thank okay? You. Thank you. Okay, but, you but, but we don't know what Jesus said or believed in. All we have is the record of what Christians believed about him and embedded in the, in the, in the narrative that they created about him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So... I, I don't see how anybody can say, you know, this is what Jesus believed, or this is what Jesus said, or we don't, we can't know, you know. In, I can the, say one in, thing for sure, is that, you know, you could take a, any, anybody's statement, even, I could I could tell uh, my neighbor, hey, I'm going to be gone all day when my wife gets home, tell her this, and then the day ends, and then he forgets till the next day, and then he goes back and repeats what I said, but he added a question mark in the sentence, or... You know, he added a, a um, an, an extra adjective or a pronoun or whatever that changes everything. I mean, so you're talking about 30, 40, and 50 years later, these things were these things were written that were written and collected together. So, 
And, and there's another thing you have to remember. The narrative of Jesus in the Gospels were written in order to prove something. So there are areas of disagreement where the reason why they disagree is because each gospel writer is inventing a story about Jesus in order to show that he fulfilled a, a prophecy. But since each of the, of the gospel writers, you know, writing this story, understand the prophecy differently, they invent the story about Jesus to indicate that he fulfilled their idea of what that prophecy meant. Okay, and the best example is, what did Jesus ride on when he came into Jerusalem the first time? Okay, I think the two, two discussions are Matthew and Mark, 12, 21, 21, 12, I don't remember the, the verses, but Matthew clearly says that Jesus rode, rode into Jerusalem riding on two donkeys. Mark's version explicitly says that Jesus rode into Jerusalem the first time while riding only on one donkey. Matthew explicitly says this was done in order to fill what the prophet said when he said, Behold, your king comes to you lowly and riding on an animal and on a, on, and on a foal, the, the, the donkey, whatever. Okay. Uh, if you want, we can look up the exact quotes. But the point is, is that Matthew writes about Jesus riding in the Jerusalem on two animals because he understands Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, talking about two animals. So he creates a story where he's riding on two animals. Mark, on the other hand, properly understands Zechariah to be only talk Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 and 10, to be talking about only one animal. So when he invents his story about Jesus, he invents it where where Jesus is riding only on one animal. The history has not created the story. Matthew interprets the, the, the Zechariah passage one way. He writes his passage that way. Mark interprets the same passage differently. He writes his story about Jesus differently. They're not history. They're not writing truth. They're not writing what they witnessed. They're not writing what happened. They're writing, they're inventing stories about Jesus to make it look like they, they, that he fulfilled scripture. And they write the story to fulfill the scripture as interpreted by the authors of those stories. So we don't know what Jesus said. We don't know what he did. All we have are the records of the believers in Jesus. I hope that answered his question. So oh. Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Is Zechariah 9, 9 talking about two animals or one animal? Matthew understood it to be two animals. He invented a story about two animals. Mark wrote, Mark understood Zechariah 9, 9 to be talking about one, and he wrote it about one. What's the answer? The answer is this is biblical poetry, which is a poetry called parallelism, describing in different words the same thing. Lowly and riding upon an ass is parallel to upon a colt the foal of an ass. Okay? O daughter of Zion, shout O daughter of Jerusalem. Daughter of Jerusalem is parallel to daughter of Zion, because Zion is another name for a mountain in Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. He is just in having salvation. It's 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 biblical poetry, which is parallelism, a rhyming of, of of idea, not a rhyming of sound. And if I remember correctly, it's Matthew. Yes, Matthew 21. Okay. And when they drew nigh into Jerusalem, they were coming to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus to disciples, saying to them, "Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loosen them and bring them to me." Okay, but if you take a look at Mark, and I think it's 12, Mark 11. Call you live on the air. Please tell us where you're calling from. Uh, hey, uh, this is Robert calling from North Carolina. Robert, welcome. What's the question you have for today? Yeah, um... In Galatians chapter three, Ooh, Galatians. Paul says that um, Paul says that the uh, Torah or the law is given 
by angels. I'm just wondering where that comes from. Is that something Paul made up or something in Jewish tradition? What what specific verse was that again? It is in verse 19. 19. 319. Gotcha from angels. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, never heard that question before, so that's a good one. So, Okay, Robert, go ahead and hang up now to your answer. Thank you. All right, thank you. And the only answer I can give is I have no idea where they get this from. Yes, it is possible <sighs> that in some midrash somewhere, some rabbi was waxing esoteric, but in the scripture itself, I have no idea where they get the idea that the that the law was ordained by angels into the hand of a mediator. Mediator would be Moses. Okay, I don't know where they get that idea. Well, if Paul really believed that to begin with, you'd think he'd be enforcing the Torah more. Yeah, yeah. You have angels in Genesis. You have Exodus 14, Exodus 23. The Ten Commandments were given at Sinai, which is Exodus 20. So I don't even see the word angel being used in or around or near uh, the Sinai experience. So I, I don't know where he got that from. Like like the caller, like Robert was asking, was saying, it could come from a midrash. I have no idea, but I don't happen to think so. So okay, great. If you have a question in the chat, be sure to tag at Tanakh Talk so I can see it pretty easily. Otherwise, it's going to get missed. Okay, I've got your next question here. He said, I would like to know how Jesus violated Shabbat because he was sentenced to death because he violated Shabbat, right? No. I don't know, but that's, that's, that's the question. So, But he was, uh, but he did violate Shabbat. Yeah, but that has nothing to do with why he was condemned. He was sentenced to death by Rome because he was viewed as an insurrectionist. That's why they was crucified him, because crucifixion, according to Tacitus, Josephus, Philo, I think I'm missing somebody, Every each one of them said that uh, uh, Rome reserved crucifixion for insurrectionists, for people trying to overthrow right. uh, or the government of Rome. Yep, yeah, everything you just said is like right on. So, okay, we've got some callers calling in. Now let me go ahead and catch this. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Uh, Jason from North Carolina. Jason, Hi. how are you? I'm fantastic, sir. Question for the rabbi. All right. Um, okay, so uh, now correct me if I'm wrong, but the law is where where sin comes from, right? Like that's where we got, where we understand what sin is, right? right. Is the law? Yep. No. Okay. So that's violation of the law. Okay. So, um, so Jesus said that, that not one jot nor tittle of the law should be finished, shouldn't be done away with until all is fulfilled. But James said that to know if to do good and to do it not is sin. So what's the, um, like, what's the, di- like, is there, I mean, what what does the law even mean if you just know if to do good and to do it not? Well, anybody who's seeking to follow Hashem is going to be seeking what the laws are, so they're not going to be, they may be ignorant of them in the beginning. And if you do vi- accidentally violate something ignorantly, you still have a, if you're Jewish, of course, and you, you still have a process of fixing it, it doesn't mean you're a sinner. It just means you violated a law and you, you gotta, you got to do something to fix it. Um, but as far as a mature adult, um, to to know to do to know good and to not do it is sin. It's it's kind of the same thing, but it also plays on your morals as well. You know, if you're if you're compelled to to give tzedaka, uh, for some reason you for some reason you choose not to because you, you know, for whatever reason you chose not to, then that could be sin to you, depending on the nature of your process. You know what I mean? So, Rabbi, what's your thoughts on that? Okay, a number of things. First of all. Uh, the the whole concept that the law brought sin into the world is very Christian, not Judaism. Okay, that's one thing. Second of all, Judaism not only says be good, Judaism also legislates and defines goodness. So a person is good if they give money to poor people. So if I give a penny to a poor person, I'm obviously a good person. No, because Judaism... The Bible quantifies what that means and says that, you know, you're supposed to give a certain percentage of your grain, okay, to the upkeep of the temple, to the to the uh, Levites and priests who don't have their own land. 10% tithe, okay? So if I give a penny, that doesn't make me a good person, okay? Second, another thing, you know, Judaism legislates it, you know, and and, and quantifies it makes it law, 
and quantifies it. It's not enough to just to say to somebody, be a good person. How do you be a good person? In what way do you become a good person? Okay, another thing that's important, and you have to understand this. In Judaism, a person is only a sinner if they sin. But after they repent of that sin, they're not a sinner anymore. In Christianity, being a sinner is a state of being. You are a sinner no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter where you go. doesn't matter. You are a sinner. In Judaism, you sin either by accident or by intent when you break one of the laws of God. But in Christianity, you sin because you're a sinner, not because you, you, you make a bad choice. You make a bad choice because you're a sinner. There's no concept of innocent until proven guilty in Christianity. <laughs> no, you begin you begin you, from the very beginning. You start off being guilty as, yeah. as as guilty of sin from Adam and Eve, for which there's nothing you can do, nothing you can do to take away the guilt of that sin away from yourself, even though you're not the one who perpetrated it. Yeah. Okay. So, the, <sighs> tell me something. Yes, I understand what he's saying. Okay, I understand what he's saying. Okay, until there's a law that says thou shalt not murder, is it okay for me to murder? How did how did Cain know that he should hide from God after he murdered Abel? Because in his heart he knew it was wrong. He didn't need a law to tell him it was wrong. He knew it was wrong. Why did why did Cain throw it right back into God's face? When God says, where is your brother? And what was what was Cain's response? Am I my brother's keeper? No, that's not what he said. He didn't say, am I my brother's keeper? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Where were you, God? That's the implication of that. In, in Hebrew, it's a nuance of the Hebrew language that the last word is what is emphasized. Hashomer achi anochi? Am I my brother's keeper? Where were you, God, is what the implication is. So Cain, why does Cain throw it back? Because he felt guilty. Why does he feel guilty? Because in his heart, without having the Ten Commandments, okay, without some printed screen thing on, on tacked up to a tree, he knew that murder was not good, was a bad thing, was wrong. So we have something called natural law. We have something innate in us, a conscience. Okay, God's first... Um, fight against uh, against immoral behavior, we know what's right and wrong without there being a law that says, you know, thou shalt not murder. We know that murder is a bad thing. So the idea that the law brought sin into the world is, is nonsense because and nobody had ever said thou shalt not murder to Cain and yet he felt bad and guilty for what he had done and tried to hide the fact because he knew it was wrong. I hope that answered his question. Right, that, was, that was very thorough. Okay, Cole, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name, where you're calling from. Yeah, my name's Cole. I'm calling from Seattle. Cole, welcome. How are you? Good, thank God. I have a question about the law. Okay. Everybody keeps talking about the law. Um, it's my understanding that no one person can fulfill the law because the law, part of the law is for women, part of the law is strictly for men, part of the law is for people in mourning, part of the law even deals with, God forbid, divorce. Um, so. Or no one person can fulfill the law, but I keep hearing Christians saying, oh, this one person fulfilled the entire law, therefore we're don't, <laughs> we don't have to follow under it, That's which they never had to follow under in the first place right. because they had the seven Noahide laws. Exactly. So I'm very confused when I hear Christians talking about the law, the law, the law. Well, and think, maybe you could give some clarification on this. I, I think you just did. <laughs> well, no, there's, that's there's, good though. Good a, question. Go ahead, right, go ahead and hang up, Cole, and do a tune in for your answer. Okay. Right, Thank there's you. A, there's a few things I would like to say about this. Yeah, go for it. That's okay. Good. First of all, let's be explicitly clear: what law existed? What law was in effect when Paul kept writing against the law? It's called antinomianism, being against the law. What was what was the law he was writing against? God's law. God's law is dictated by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. Hello. There was no, what other law would he be referring to? Okay, the Constitution of the United States. Come on. Okay, so we're very clear that what Paul is writing against is God's law as recorded in the Torah. Okay. Next thing. 
Okay. Um, uh, I just lost my weight. I hate when I do that. Uh, what, what was You're this? comparing law with uh, which which law would he, was he possibly talking about? The Constitution is nonsense. That was your right. Trigger. Okay, right. And, and the the whole point of of Jesus fulfilled the law. He came and he did all the law. Therefore, nobody else has to do it. My analogy, which you've heard on Tanakh talk before, I will tell you again. If you are driving a car and you come up to a stop sign and the person in front of you perfectly obeys the laws of stopping at a stop sign, does that mean that nobody ever has to stop at a stop sign again because the guy in front of you fulfilled it perfectly? It's nonsense. It doesn't even make sense. It's illogical. Just because, let's say, let's pretend, which he did not, but let's pretend, even though he didn't, that Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. That means nobody else has to follow the law again. So Jesus fulfilled the law, so it's okay to murder? Thou shalt murder? Thou shalt steal? I mean, it, does, it, it, it defies reason to say that because one person fulfilled it perfectly, that nobody ever has to fulfill it again. Okay? And, 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 and what is the purpose of the law? What's the purpose of it? The only reason why we are supposed to go 20 miles an hour in a school zone is to teach us that we will not keep the law, that we will get a ticket for speeding eventually, and therefore uh, we need the judge to forgive us. Is, is that really what the purpose of the law is, to go 20 miles an hour in a school zone? No. It's God forbid if you hit a kid, he's more likely to survive. If something bad happens within the school zone and you're following the law, less bad things will happen. Okay? The law is a gift to us because the law makes the world better. It makes us better off if we follow the law. So the whole, con the whole concept that Christianity has about law, about Jewish law, is just patent nonsense from the very beginning. By the way, my analogy while you're looking, yeah. my, my analogy to continue the discussion about law is if I am not driving an 18-wheeler, should I be arrested for not fulfilling the laws of driving an 18-wheeler? This goes to what he was saying about there are laws for women, there are laws for men, there are laws for farmers, there are laws for people in Israel, laws for people. Okay, if you're not following the laws of driving an 18-wheeler, am I breaking the law? Of not of driving an 18 wheeler. No, because those laws don't even apply to me until I get behind the wheel of an 18 wheeler. Same thing with I I forgot the number. I don't remember numbers anyway. But, but uh, less than half of the 613 laws will apply to any one person. So and so his point is totally well taken. What requirements does Hashem give in the Torah for a Gentile to convert to the community of Israel? I, I'm not quite sure, T. Scott Major, what you're asking. Are you asking, where does it say that a Gentile is required to convert? Or are you saying... what Process. Is, what he is, wants to know the process. Where does the Torah state the process? And it, and it doesn't. You have to, that's written in the oral law. That's what I was trying to tell him. I don't, I don't well, think that even, his... even Wait a minute. Even if, it's, even if the process is found in the oral law, the Bible, the Tanakh, explicitly talks about people becoming Jews. Right, like in Esther, or where was that? In... Uh, it's Esther chapter 8. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, yep. so it they're... says they became Jews. Yeah. Well, it doesn't say how they did, but there had to have been a process. Right, right, exactly. Okay. Uh, Thank you for that. When, I totally when, forgot that one. When, when Ruth, in the book of Ruth, Ruth says, you know, says a specific statement, you know, uh, your people will be my people, your God will be my God, where you'll be buried, I'll be buried. Uh, and, and there's, there's, you know, an interesting analysis, by the way, of these things. Where you be buried, I will be buried. That means Israel becomes my, my country too. Uh, your God will be my God. It means your religion becomes my religion too. Your people will become my people. Which means I'm not just learning a bunch of facts and get a PhD in Judaism. That wouldn't make me a Jew. But the fact that your people become my people, I become part of your nation. Oh, like I don't know, naturalization to become a citizen of the na of a new nation. Okay, our process of naturalization is called conversion to the religion, because we are in fact a nation. Because that's what God was. God told Abraham, "I will make you a great ethnic group." No, 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 no. 
I will make you a great culture. Mm, sorry. I will make you a great family. Wrong again. I will make you a great nation because we are a nation defined by our religion. Anyway. Call you live on the air. Please tell us where you're calling from. Hello? Yes, you're live uh, on the air. Yes, um, I'd like to ask uh, the rabbi, like, if what if there are people that would like to f follow the Torah, but they didn't want to become Jews, but they wanted to follow, you know, like observe all of the, you know, like the laws of the Torah to the best of their ability. Like, what, 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 is, what does he think about that? Gotcha. Well, okay. Go, go ahead and hang up for your answer. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. People get the uh, okay. question comes in frequently. So the, the immediate question I have to ask is, why do they feel they have to? In other words, let me rephrase that. That's poorly worded. Sorry. Judaism does not require a person to become a Jew. You can have a relationship directly with God, the Creator, okay, without convert con blah, 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 without conversion to Judaism. The means through which you can do that is called becoming a Bnei Noach, becoming a, a acknowledging and recognizing that you are a descendant of Noah and have a covenant with God that's called the covenant God made with Noah. Okay, there are seven commandments, but they're really not, they're really seven, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, seven subject, no, seven categories. Couldn't think of the word. They're really more like seven categories than seven commandments. And each category has, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, like applications. Okay. Thou shalt not steal. So does that mean it's okay if I uh, don't take something that's yours, but in fact I cheat you out of something? So it's okay to cheat you out of something, but not to actually steal it? No, because the, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, no, I forgot the word again. It's a category. Stealing is a category, and you have to look at the seven commandments. That really is seven categories. Uh, but 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 my point is is that um, you don't have to be a Jew, and the laws of the Torah were given to the Jewish people. Take the the big top ten, okay? The Ten Commandments, the Aserdi broke, okay? The the ten statements. What's the first statement, okay? Uh, I am the eternal new God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Gentiles were not brought out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The Ten Commandments are explicitly given to the people of uh, the Jewish people, the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and or, or those who convert to their real fully convert to their religion. But a person doesn't have to convert to Judaism to have a very direct, very specific relationship with God. Now. Now, once you recognize that you are, in fact, a B'nai Noach, that you are, in fact, part of the covenant God made with Noah and all of Noah's descendants, which means every human being on earth, now you need to study what that means. You have to learn about what that means. And according to many, if you are accepting the, um, if, if you are accepting the um, stay, status of being B'nai Noach, you are putting upon yourself that that relationship with God. You know, you talk to your rabbi about doing more. And that's the means through which Judaism has for Gentiles, for non-Jews, to have a very specific covenant covenantal relationship with God. Any, anything else you want to say? Um, so, yeah, as far as the Noah thing goes, yeah. I mean, you pretty right. much covered it. The, the one thing I was going to say for sure, though, is um, mm -hmm. you said in, in the caller uh, mentioned if I want to observe the commandments of God the best I can, you can you can do that still as, uh, as a volunteer, but you're not commanded to, like keeping Shabbat. But, but what you're not permitted to do is to try to do it try to find out the way the Jewish people do it so you can mimic that. You're not allowed to do that. So if you want to keep Shabbat, just just take the day off, rest, whatever, go fishing, you know, go to a movie, whatever, do some Bible study, whatever. That You're allowed to do that. Um, if you want to eat kosher, you can. Non-Jews don't have to eat kosher. We do. Well, not, not necessarily, like, uh, what's the proper term? Um, 
we show me kashrut. Yeah, yeah, we're not, yeah, we're not kashrut. Just can't find anything like that around here. But, but we definitely avoid eating pork and shellfish and stuff like that. So, but all those things. But it's, key thing, just don't try to do it exactly like they do, because yeah, we weren't we're not commanded to do so. <clears throat> so that was my last statement. Okay. Okay, cool. Here's a good one. Uh, donation five dollars from the good Reverend Robbins. What is the synagogue of Satan in Revelation? In, is Revelation anti-Semitic? Oh boy, you, that's a great question because the video I just put live an hour ago was on Revelation chapter one. We just started the new series on Revelation. Uh, so if you look those in the uh, Mr. R- uh, Reverend Robbins, uh, Monday morning at eight thirty uh, is when the shows go live. Uh, usually the next day. They'll go. The second replay will happen. So you have two. You have two times to be able to watch it. But this one's already ready and up. You can watch it now. Uh, and it's just called Revelation Chapter One. So go to my channel, look for Revelation Chapter One. Uh, but we haven't talked about the synagogue of Satan yet. But you're asking about Revelations. This is one series you don't want to miss. Yeah. Well, he's. You know, many other people will give their answer, and that's fine. I have my answer. Revelation, Chapter Three, Verse Nine. Book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Ooh, that sounds like the Messianics. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, Look, I don't give credibility to anything in the New Testament. Yeah. Okay? If there's anything good in the New Testament, it's not new. Yeah. If there's anything new in the New Testament, it's not good. So yep. if there's anything worthwhile in the New Testament, it's only because they're actually quoting Jewish sources. That's right. However, however, it just seems just strikes me as Revelation three nine make them the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews but are not and lie. That is that is a perfect description of the Messianic Jewish community who claim that they are Jews but who lie. Okay, the incredibly vast majority of Synagogue, uh, of messianic quote unquote synagogues are made up of people whose ancestors were never Jews. Right. I, and and I, I've heard different different statistics. Okay. Let's say let's say which I think is very very high, outrageously high. But let's pretend there are forty percent, forty percent, still less than half, but forty percent of a Messianic synagogue who can trace their lineage back to Jews. That means that 60% are not. They say they are Jews, but lie. Okay? There are Messianic rabbis, okay, who say, oh, you know, I was raised Orthodox. Really? That's interesting. Do they ever give the name of their Orthodox synagogue? Has it ever been, you know, when, when any of these Messianics say that they were raised Orthodox, and they actually have the audacity to give the name of their quote-unquote synagogue, okay, where they were raised, I will call up the, the that that synagogue and say, hey, I'm trying to locate a friend of mine, the last name, and they never have heard of the family name, okay? H- how many of these Messianic rabbis changed their name from some like Christopher Christensen to something like, oh, I don't know, uh, Tuvia Zaretsky? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. That's the Messianic rabbi uh, who's the head of the Jews for Jesus of Los Angeles. His name was originally Lloyd Carson, okay? Or people who will say, well, you know, I did a DNA test, and the DNA test says that I'm, you know, 20% Jewish. Well, no, it says your ancestors' DNA product could have totaled up to be 20%, but that's about your ancestors. That's not about you. Okay. What does 20% mean? Okay. If you say 25%, that means that one fourth, one out of four of your grandparents had to be Jewish. Oh, really? Does it? What happens if you got 10% of this uh, ancestor and 5% of this one, that's 15 total, and Three over here and two, you see what I'm saying? It can still total up, but it only tells us about their ancestors. It doesn't make them Jews. We're not a race, okay? There's no genetic code that makes you a Jew. It indicates two things. It indicates that your ancestors might have had Jews among them, and it may give you a direction to look to see if your mother's 
mother's mother's mother's mother's mother's mother's mother's mother's mother's mother's mother's was Jewish. Okay, it gives you a place to go investigate. Okay, but it doesn't make you a Jew. So all these people running around doing everything they can, play dress up and put on Jewish clothing because it makes them feel Jewish. Okay, doesn't make them a Jew. It's going to be from okay. Dean. Um, so what was the religion of Moses according to Judaism? According to Judaism, because the word Judaism comes from Judah, that's which is after Moses. So what what religion would one say that Moses or even Abraham? I won't wait, go as far wait, as Abraham. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Judah is the son of who? Jacob. Right. You're telling me that Judah comes after Moses? Okay, wait, let's, wait, Dean, let, let's just back up a step and let's talk about this for a minute, okay? Judaism, the religion of Judah, okay, is talking about the religion of the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah. It's not the tribe of Judah, which would only be one person, okay, one, one of the sons of, uh, of Jacob, one of the 12 tribes. It's not the tribe of Judah that we get the word Judaism, Judy, Jew, okay, J Jude, uh, Yehuda is what I meant, okay? We get that from the name of the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom of Judah had members of every single tribe in the southern kingdom, according to Second Chronicles. And it says that a few times. And, and if you ask me, I, I can go look up explicit chapter and verse. Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 9. And he gathered all of Judah and Benjamin and those dwelling with them from Ephraim and Manasseh and from Simon, for many of Israel, that's the northern kingdom, had defected to them when they saw that the eternal their God was with them. Or Second Chronicles chapter 11, verse 3. Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Sh Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah. All Israel in Judah, the tribes of the northern kingdom had deserted Israel, the northern kingdom, and come to the southern kingdom of Judah. Think of the word American. An American, the name for our country, or uh, what's it called? Hemis uh, continent, uh, whatever it is, okay, comprises people from many different backgrounds, and many different nations, many different tribes, many different, a lot of things. But they're all called American. The word Jew and the word Judah and the word Judaism are all derived like the same kind of thing. It's the southern kingdom that incorporates members of every single one of the 12 tribes. Okay, so we wouldn't call the religion of Moses Judaism. We might call it an earliest form of Judaism. We might say that we, we say that Abraham was the first Jew because the word Jew refers to the same people as the word Israelite, which refers to the same people as the people who referred to as Hebrews. It's just a different name for the same people. So we use the word Jew as an all-encompassing thing because they're all from the 12 tribes of the people of Israel or those who converted to become Jews, as it explicitly calls uh, uh, Persians in the book of Esther chapter 8, the last verse, second to the last verse. It's either the last verse or the second last verse of the eighth chapter of the book of Esther. It says they became Jews. Well, the people who became Jews were not any descendants of any tribe, and yet they became Jews. They were known as Jews. But the word is derived from the southern kingdom, not from the tribe of Judah. How about when Jesus is called the king of the Jews? So you're telling me that Jesus was only the king of the descendants of the single tribe of Judah. If, if the word Jew only refers to descendants of Judah, then when Jesus is called the king of the Jews, he's only the king of the one tribe of Jews who were from the tribe of Judah? <laughs> That's so, a good point. So Jesus, so Jesus really wasn't the king of the priests, the Levites? According to Christianity, I guess you're right, because Jew only refers to the tribe of Judah. Therefore, Jesus as king of the Jews was only the king of one tribe, which is the Judah, Judahites. Right. Come, come on. Come on. Even in the New Testament, the word Jew refers to all descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and anybody who joins their religion like we have in the book of Esther. Okay, here's the uh, the last question. <clears throat> I'm going to cover you up for a second so we can see it. 
says the stone that the builders rejected became the chief capstone, the chief cornerstone. Psalm 118, verse 22. What? Because Christianity says that that's Jesus. Of course, there's that New Testament reference there. But so what? 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 And who is this? Here it says a cornerstone, not the cornerstone, which is interesting. I never saw that before. Okay, wait a minute. <clears throat> uh, Twenty-two and Hebrew and Evan Maaslu. Habonim Haital the Rosh Pina. Okay, Evan Maaslu Habonim. Hi Tala Rosh Pina Evan Masu Habonim Hi Tala Rosh Pina Okay fine uh, a, a stone not the stone Right That's okay. funny So yeah, I mean, that's interesting funny. Yeah So that you're right Okay so who is this referring to well, I don't know The whole thing seems to be a praise of God give thanks to the Lord he is good Okay maybe it's, it's a way of saying that um, God will become the chief cornerstone of the whole universe. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe, uh, let's see. Maybe it's talking about David. Maybe, maybe they, talk, they maybe rejected talking about David. They rejected okay. David. It's a or, David. Or what about the whole people of Israel, yeah. <clears throat> which everybody rejects, everybody yeah. hates, everybody, you know, anti-Semitism. Did you see the, did you see the uh, special, <sighs> CNN, but whatever. Okay, did you see the special on CNN of anti-Semitism on Sunday night? It's no. on on demand, so if you have it, you can get it. Still watch it. Okay. But the Jews, anti-Semitic acts, okay, are five times more often than uh, acts against Muslims, blacks, okay? The most hate, hate crimes in the United States taking place today are against Jews. Okay, well. so we are the ones who are rejected. Okay, so maybe we're the cornerstone that has been rejected, but will now become the chief cornerstone when the real Messiah comes and the Jews are shown to be right. Yep. Well, there you go. That was a good, almost a full show. I'll edit this one down to, to make sure it all fits <clears throat> properly, but... Um, but you guys, thank you all for tuning in. Robert, thank you for your time. And Brenda, uh, Brenda Alicia turns must musings. William, you are still not well. Please take care and a refuah yeah. shlema. And thank that indicates all of our sentiments. Take care you. of you, William. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, th I think so. It's been like this for about two weeks. Yesterday was definitely the pinnacle because yesterday I couldn't even function. Today I felt better, felt pretty, really good this morning. But after about lunch, it started declining. And then now it's kind of like back the way it was two or three days ago. But I think the pinnacle of it the heart the really bad part i think is over i think i'm gonna slowly taper out of this thing i'm just looking like um so but guys uh for if you uh know anybody's looking for this video it won't be ready until tomorrow probably noon or 5 p.m i'm not really sure what i'm gonna do with it yet so it'll be tomorrow though before this video is ready to rewatch. now if you're if you're a member if you've joined the tanak talk channel this video will be readily can, can available we talk, for can you we talk now. about that can we talk about joining sure okay uh, somebody who's I can't remember who it was said I've been donating for very for you know for a very long time. Does that automatically make me a member? No, it does not. It's it, exactly. it's a it's a separate thing. You have to look at it like uh, so do, the donations that people send in. It's for it's it's because they they just want to support the channel, and then this is a completely separate thing. And so it's like now, for example. <clears throat> um, I went and spent like uh, almost a thousand dollars on on cups for to to, to give away as donate for donations to increase the donations. Uh, but some people feel like, well, they should get a free cup since they already donate. But that's kind of defeating the purpose of me getting those cups. The whole point is to to get those to help to kind of help finance the studio. So, um, but even if I wanted to, there's no way for me to allow someone to join without that person paying YouTube directly because YouTube gets their cut, which is pretty hefty. There's is like 40, 49 percent or 45 percent. I thought Good it was 30. Lord. I thought it was 30% at first, but it's looking like it's more like 40, 45 percent. So, Lord. so you have to pay if you want to get on this, you have to, you pay YouTube and YouTube gives me a cut of it. So there's no way I can add you. Even if you, even if you donated $10,000 a month, I still couldn't add you if I wanted to. That's the whole, that's the whole point. And you're not missing anything. You still get to see all the live videos. You get to see all the edited videos. The only thing you won't be able to see is like the original video 
after the edited one goes live because those stay set aside for that's just an extra member perk to kind of give them something special and if you do want to join us remember you get uh, other special videos that I do from you know just studio tours and home life stuff that I just put in a little private box and if you want to join you can check those out so it's only like five bucks a month so uh, or four ninety nine. so uh, and, 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 and I they, literally get like $2.70 of that so do, do they do they let us join as a year at a time I don't I don't know how that works I don't think okay. I, I don't know how that works. I think they do it month by month. I'm guessing that you might, but I'm not really sure. So, but uh, that's really that's a good point though, because a full year is only sixty bucks. I mean, that, that's God's less than a tank of gas these days. So anyway, um, okay, cool. So that's that's kind of a wrap. Uh, yep, that's good. So, Robert, thank you for your time. Thank you for tuning in. Seriously though, I really appreciate you guys out there, and uh, uh, look forward to talking to you guys again soon. Tomorrow is Wednesday. So 5 p.m. will be the weekly Parsha for this coming up Shabbat. Um, and then we will talk to you then. So you all have a wonderful evening. Rabbi, thank you. We'll see you. Any way I can help. All right, all right. I enjoy it. Very good, very good.